Okay, uh, thanks uh, very much, everybody. Welcome to today's seminar, uh, which is on uh, crisis management in the food and beverage sector. Um, just to point out before we make a start that this session is being recorded. Um, and so, you know, if you wish to raise questions during the session, then please do bear that in mind because they may they may be discussed in open forum. Uh, so you can use the Q and A function, and we'll address. Uh, your questions uh, at the end of the session if we can um, but only the panelists will be able to see your questions so they they, they can remain anonymous alternatively if you uh, want to contact any of the panelists offline after the event then please do so they'd be more than uh, more than happy to to hear from you um, so just before we make a start uh, we asked uh, you a question um, uh, as you came in about whether your organization in your view is well prepared to manage manage a crisis situation and you can see the diversity of opinion there so 59 percent say yes uh, and 40 one percent uh, are saying no so that's that's quite interesting really um um and 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 hopefully therefore this uh session will be pardon the pun food for thought uh for for, for many of you um so just by way of background my name is alex kenworthy i'm a corporate partner uh, at mills and reeve and a member of the food and agri business sector um, as many of you will know, uh, the food and agribusiness sector is a key sector for, for Mills and Reeve, and we act for clients right across the sector from farm to fork. Um, one of our panellists today, uh, Jess Burt, as some of you will know, is a, is a regular blogger and vlogger, uh, with, together with her co-star Bella, the, the, the King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. You may, you may have seen her, but uh, uh, she, she blogs on, on a variety of sector issues, uh, and crisis management is one which always generates a considerable amount of interest. And so that was, the, uh, that was the, um, the prompt for today's session. It's topical, and it's an important subject. Um, so we put together a, a panel of experts um, to look at the subject of crisis management from a wide variety of angles. So I'm pleased to say we're joined today by, by Jess Burt. She's a specialist food regulatory lawyer here at Mills and Reeve. Uh, we've got Eric Alter, who's an insurance broker at Mar Marsh and is a specialist in crisis management. Uh, we've got uh, my colleague Simon Ellsgood, who's a commercial contracts lawyer at Mills and Reeve. Um, we've got um, Sam Kennelly, who's a director at Turquoise PR. And also my colleague, Richard Dawson Gerard, who's a, a commercial disputes partner at Mills and Reeve and regularly deals with crises for, for clients, including reputation management issues. So you've got a really good panel uh, of people here who uh, who are, are, are used to working uh, within the sector. What I'm going to do is to ask a few questions of each of the panelists on this subject to draw out their experiences of, of crisis management. Um, and ask them to share some tips based on, on the experiences which they have. I think it's worth saying before we start that a crisis can take a variety of forms. Um, and whilst we're looking here at more operational crises in the food and beverage sector, such as food contamination, for example, or crises due to external factors, so it could be supply chain contamination or, 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 or reputational issues caused by the actions of a third party, um, it's important to, to appreciate that it can, you know, a crisis can hit a business regardless of sector in a number of ways. So it could be a cyber attack. It could be the death or, or, or of a key player in the business, you know, which has far reaching implications. Um, so if those particular angles are, are of interest to you, then do keep an eye out for some of the other webinars which we run. Uh, so members of our private wealth team and our IT teams, for example, who will run. Uh, uh, specific seminars on those subjects. But uh, that said, a lot of the issues we're discussing today will be regardless, uh, relevant regardless of sector. Um, but but the emphasis will very much be on the on the food and beverage sector. So I'm going to kick off by uh, introducing Jess. Welcome, Jess. Um, uh, so you are a food lawyer and crisis management is something which you come across a lot in your role as, 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 as a food lawyer at Mills and Reeve. And uh, a subject which you you advise on regularly. Why don't you kick off by giving us some examples of the crisis situations you've advised on, and some of the key themes and takeaways which have come out from those experiences? Thank you, Alex. Um, so it's important to note that not every crisis is going to develop into a, a fully blown crisis situation, um, but it is 
really important that every potential crisis is properly managed. And this is why the whole um, webinar is, is entitled the crisis management. So it's the process that you go through and a properly handled crisis can actually provide opportunities and development to a food company. Um, the main aspects of managing the crisis, the first one and the most important one that I'm going to be dealing with is actually identifying um, the crisis situation, what the issue is, um, before you would then sort of seek to escalate that to a management plan and the investigation of that assessment, the risk assessment of it, um, and the decision making that goes behind it. It's very important to sort of work out exactly what has happened uh, and what requirements, if any, have been breached, whether there is a um, a requirement to withdraw or recall under legislation or whether uh, it's necessary as a commercial withdrawal for the company or whether this is a breach of contract exactly what has happened where within uh, your business to see what your legal obligations are and then move from that to decide what your commercial obligations are and as Alex mentioned, um, I am a, a food regulatory and food product liability specialist. So in relation to the food sector specifically, uh, the identification of where there may be a problem, the key issue, the priority for all food businesses has to be food safety. Um, so that is the absolute keystone that your first priority should be always. Uh, in trying to sort of identify where there may be an issue, the first point we're looking at would be if there's a breach of food safety requirements. Um, this is all set out in, in Regulation 178-2002. And it has two spheres to it. It has um, whether the, the food has become unfit for human consumption um, and uh, also whether it's injurious to health. So the safety aspect here also encompasses quality and the idea of fitness. Um, and that is governed really by the sort of normal conditions for use and the labelling. So, um, you know, a, a raw chicken isn't necessarily unsafe. You've got to have your instructions and the normal conditions for use underlying it. Um, in relation to looking at what might be injurious um, to health. You have aspects such as short term. So the key example for that would be allergens, um, you know, a short term health impact for you. Uh, there's also issues such as choking. You have the situation there might be a contamination with, uh, for example, small plastic pieces that would become an immediate short term choking hazard. And you look at the size of the contamination in, the, in those parts as well. There's also encompassed long term. And this is where you get these um, chemical contaminations uh, such as genotoxic carcinogens. We saw that with the para red Sudan one issue. Uh, we've seen it most recently with the ethylene oxide. Um, where there are small amounts of contamination within your supply chain. And um, because that is a genotoxic carcinogen, it's sort of how you develop your risk assessment process, how you decide what to do as a result of that. Um, the other sphere of this would be unfit for human consumption. And this encompasses, uh, I get lots of questions asking, so, so you know, what is unfit? And it encompasses the concept of acceptability. So this really has to be looked at on very much a case by case basis on the food type, on the consumer aspect as well. What sort of um, sector of consumers are, are um, eating the food or consuming the beverage? And it would we'd look at sort of quality, colour, taste. So this would be perhaps where there is a taint, a uh, particular reaction, perhaps a cloudiness to the product. Um, and an aspect of that is how far along does that go until it becomes um, not acceptable to the consumer? So there's a whole variety of aspects that go into that. And it needs to be sort of individually looked at as to whether or not it will breach that quality side. 
Um, and separate but overlapping would be on the sort of regulatory breach. Now, there's a sort of rebuttable presumptions under food safety requirements that if you comply with all the uh, legislative requirements, then it's uh, the product would be deemed safe. But that's rebuttable. Um, and equally, if you do conform with all the legal requirements, then that doesn't prevent action. So um, you really do need to look at the regulatory side as well. Examples of regulatory breach that wouldn't necessarily breach food safety requirements would be potentially on the labelling side where you've got reserved descriptions, legally defined names. Um, so the average consumer in the street, the average man on the Clapham omnibus is not going to know the ins and outs of uh, the requirements for uh, chocolate. Uh, if you are a couple of percentages out of that, that's not going to make it sort of unacceptable to them. However, uh, it is going to be a technical breach of the um, requirements. And that is where you come through to, sort of, you know, more the contractual, more the commercial risk to the business. Um, and we've seen a number of other things that can affect uh, foodstuffs. You've got the political activist risk. We saw um, Gourmet Burger Kitchen with their um, advertising uh, in Veganuary saying, uh, sort of promoting their burgers, and they thought they could take on some vegetarians and vegans, but in fact, oh, it, it actually consolidated the activist move against them. Uh, there's also positive labelling claims that can escalate into a crisis. The most well-known of these immortalised in um, the only fools and horses, the Del Boy, would be the Dasani purified water, where uh, tap water was filtered and it was all legally compliant. However, um, what hadn't been taken into account was the making of positive labelling claims on this and just how that would come across. Um, Death night, so uh, a few years later, also had a contamination issue, uh, which again showed the risk assessment process of it didn't involve safety, but um, it did involve regulatory breach. And so this is where you get the difference between a legally required uh, withdrawal and a commercial withdrawal. And um, you know there would be certain ramifications on insurance and commercial terms. So it's really important to sort of assess where you fall within that. Um, in relation to the management plan of this, so first of all, you have the identification. Then you have to have your process of escalation. So this might involve complaints handlers watching out for trends and spikes in certain complaints. It might involve your testing side where if you have a spike, um, or an elevation of certain amounts and actually also the decision making of what you test for. Sometimes within food businesses, it's very important to have that overriding view, that horizon scanning as to what you test for. And obviously being sort of, you know, careful what you want to know about as well, because you can test down to the nth degree. And it's sort of what you actually do when you have that information. Um, what you actually do when you have that information is generally fill it into a risk assessment process. It will be a case by case basis looking at your food stuff. Before a crisis happens, this is where the review and the uh, having a plan is so important because it's very hard to manage when you're in the eye of the storm. But ahead of time, if you actually review your processes, if you have practice runs, then it can feed into a risk assessment process. You can get to know your food stuff, who the consumers are. If there's a vulnerable section of the community that your food stuff is um, aimed at, then that would feed into any risk assessment process to know where your batches are, to know your supply chain, to see what historic consumptions levels are at each part of the year. Because, for example, so, you know, as you become aware of an issue, it might well be that this is a historic consumption, which has actually already fed through the supply chain. And the legal requirement for recall is only where sort of that actually has a beneficial health effect. So if you don't have any beneficial health effect from doing a recall, the legal necessity to do one falls away. 
Um, and there is the difference between withdrawal and recall. Um, and that would apply to different contract terms and warranties, etc. So it's really important to know where you stand on that and to carry out that risk assessment and to have the experts um, in your plan, their contact numbers, so that you know what to do. And you've actually thought if this information comes in, if this percentage of contamination is there, what you actually need to do about it. Um, so if you've got if you've got two separate issues, you've got sort of like, for example, a nut contamination versus a genetically modified organism contamination, those would concern very different issues. The first one, if you become aware of a nut contamination, you first of all need to sort of, you know, find out the levels, find out the batches affected, know your labelling. Do you have precautionary labelling in place? Do you have any positive free from labelling in place, in which case you'll draw in vulnerable consumers and your uh, legal requirements will be that much more onerous on you? Um, and so whereabouts in the supply chain it is. Also, you will be allowed some time to investigate where in the supply chain is your product. If it hasn't left your immediate control, it can be ring fenced immediately within your warehouses. Um, and that way, none of the legal obligations of notification, withdrawal, recall will kick in. In relation again to GMOs, that safety aspect should fall away, depending on if there is um, if there's proper traceability there and you know what what you are actually getting um, and again then it concerns the labeling the level the testing amounts and if you have any sort of free from positive claims in place um, because of this being sort of adventitious contamination it would be the sort of the labeling side of things would, would slightly differ and uh, without the safety aspect you would only need to withdraw depending on sort of contract terms and what your actual labeling is so in short, as I've only got a canter through, it's really important to know your legal obligations, know your requirements and know your product and practice it. So um, I'll pass over to Alex then. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that's given us a really good uh, insight to, to kick off with. So so lots of examples there of, of, of the kind of issues that can arise. Um, Eric, uh, over to you. So from let, let's take the worst case scenario. So from, from an insurance perspective then, what would you suggest that you know a business facing a crisis should do from an insurance perspective once it becomes aware of an issue you know talk us through the steps you know and the thought processes from your perspective okay so from from our perspective to start with um insurance is the response of last resort because in a situation like that insurance will provide a degree of cover but when you look at the total cost of risk model so what are the costs that are not covered by a policy you are still on the hook for those um, making assumptions is a dangerous thing to do. Um, so when something goes wrong, don't assume you know what is going wrong. You know, is it accidental? Is it intentional? Is it activism? Is it cyber related? And the cyber one you raised, Alex, is an interesting one because what if an organization is effectively mucking around with your processes with the sole intention of causing damage and then makes claims for money as a result of that? Um, the first thing you do when something like this happens is make contact with your insurer. Now, it really does come down to contract. So what is covered under contract? Where does the liability lie? Um, there are some, you know, I mean, the, you know, product liability claims can very much come into play, but it really does depend on what you've negotiated in the contract with the third party. So, for instance, if you do have to enforce a recall, um, is there, are there any punitive clauses in the contract that allow the third party impacted by the recall to impose charges? So as an extreme example, let's say it's a supermarket, uh, the supermarket says, right, we're going to fine you for the mere fact that this has happened. Then we're going to fine you for clearing the shelves. Then we're going to fine you for empty shelf space. Then we're going to fine you for restocking the shelves. And then we want special offers to get that shelf space back up to a uh, normal revenue stream. So it's quite complex. Um, the key thing here goes back to what Jessica was saying, which is crisis management and understanding how to respond. And the worst thing you can possibly do is to respond to the crisis for the first time when it hits. So not to have exercised and tested the crisis management response. It is absolutely critical that people are called into a room without warning. I mean, we don't suggest that you, you, know, you do it in real life. You effectively do desktop. But people, senior stakeholders are called into a room. The door is closed. And the statement is, we've been hit by an incident. 
well, what do we do from here? So who do you contact? When do you contact? Where, did you, where, did, where do we think our liability attaches? Is it incidental? Is it accidental? What do we do from here? And one of the big mistakes that organizations also make is they don't invoke their business continuity plan or their crisis management plan when they see the proverbial cloud heading across the horizon. They wait until something else has gone wrong. If you think something looks unusual, if you think there might be an issue, start your business continuity plan then, invoke it then, because that means that the team is prepared should it genuinely be an emergency. You can always wind it down, but to start when things are started, when, when you know things might go wrong, is too late. Um, always talk to your insurer, always talk to your broker, identify what is covered by the policy and what isn't covered by the policy. One of the covers you can buy nowadays is reputation insurance. Now, some people think that is a way to protect your reputation. It is not quite as broad as that. It gives you access to crisis management support if external crisis management support is required. And it gives you access to, um, uh, to reputational support. So, you know, having somebody who helps you deal with the crisis. The other thing that is key, and I hope I'm not stealing anyone's thunder here, is that you have a clear voice of the organization, the face and the voice of the organization who represents the business to the outside world. Make sure that that individual is able to answer questions and deal with it. You may have a very effective chief executive officer who, when he gets in front of a camera or into the press, melts into nothingness. You could have someone who is specifically focused on dealing with answering questions and dealing with the press and dealing with the supply chain. The other thing that you need to do from an insurability perspective is identify where the issue has come from. So is it within the entity? Is it a third party supplier? Is it the supplier of the supplier? Now, not food industry related, but if we go back about six, seven years, Toyota had a big recall on a component that could cause brake failure or the reputational damage attached to Toyota. It was an OEM product that was a supplier to a supplier, to a supplier that caused the failure. Now, the client doesn't care. I bought that item from Toyota. It has failed. It is their fault. And it's exactly the same within the food industry. The, the, the client, the, the user, the consumer doesn't care where the item comes from. It's the label they've purchased that is causing them concern. So when you look at contract, also see how you can effectively spread the insurance. So is there an ability for subrogation? And what I mean by that, a claim is made against an entity the entity's policy responds and pays out. But when it turns out that the blame for the issue actually lies outside of the affected entity, is there an ability for the insurer who is paid out to subrogate the claim, to make a claim against the third party supplier to provide some remedy for them to get some money back? But this, this is a really interesting area because insurance can only do so much. And like I said earlier, it is based on the way the contract is structured. The key thing is to understand what has happened, not to panic. Critical that you don't panic and critical that you manage the messaging within the entity and critical that you make it very, very clear that nobody within the entity is able to make any external comment. Nobody is allowed to put anything on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on email, on TikTok, on Instagram, whatever it is, because they could effectively prejudice the policy and they could potentially prejudice the business. Um, communication with key stakeholders is essential, but you do not have to share any more than you are comfortable sharing. Because if you share too much and you've actually got the information wrong, you've then got to backpedal and that makes you look fairly incompetent. So share what you have to share, but always, always engage with insurers, always, always engage with brokers, always, always engage with the third parties that an insurers have pre-cleared for you to deal with. So obviously you are, um, you know, at, at, at Mills and Reef, you're in a number of insurer panels. Um, there will be um, uh, a, a lot of uh, reputational risk organizations or communications organizations who are on those insurer panels. Make use of them. They're pre-cleared. They should know about your business to a certain degree. And they're in a really, really strong position to assist. But just to go back to the original point, practice, practice, practice. And make sure that you've decided who is in charge of the incident. It doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO or the CFO or the COO. It can be somebody who is specifically identified as the person who runs the crisis management plan. And that person must at that stage take precedence over anyone else and must, must be allowed to run the plan because the moment other directors start to intervene, it will go wrong. And what you're trying to do at this precise moment in time is to minimize the impact 
to minimize the reputational damage, to minimize the external damage, to minimize the cost. Because remember what I said at the beginning, only so much is covered by an insurance policy. That's some really, really good, uh, good tips there. And I think one of the points as well, it just sprung to mind is, you know, you, you will have turnover of staff, people change roles, people change responsibility. So again, looking at the the need to keep your plan under review and make sure people coming in, assuming those roles, uh, 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 you know, have the adequate training. And so it's, uh, it, it, it's important, again, to, to keep that, that plan under review. Um, you mentioned there, um, uh, the, the contractual situation and 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 that's um that that leads me on nicely to to introduce simon uh, and and richard um so who are who are both slightly different ends of the spectrum there but but simon is a is a commercial contracts lawyer so we'll draft and negotiate these contracts on behalf of clients and, and richard often advises clients um when when those contracts have to be looked at uh, carefully in the context of a dispute so Perhaps both of these questions are kind of there for, for both of you, really. But what what as contracts lawyers or commercial disputes lawyers, what do you see as the common avoidable pitfalls and what tips do you have for, for dealing with the contractual aspects of a crisis? Simon, perhaps if I could start with you first. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so we, yeah, we've already mentioned contracts uh, once, twice uh, in the uh, in this session before. Um, Jess was talking about know your legal obligations, and that includes um, what you're bound to do under your contracts. Um, and Eric mentions the contracts uh, with your customer who might be a supermarket, and there might be extensive, shall we say, uh, obligations um, under that uh, to uh, basically to to support the to support the customer. So the important thing in a crisis um, to remember is that there there is a contract. Uh, usually, um, either with your supplier or with your customer. Um, and so it's time to get that contract out of the out, out of the drawer and see what it says, if anything, um, that covers the situation that you're faced with. So things to bear in mind in your contract, clauses to bear in mind in your contract are force majeure clauses. So this is the one where um, neither party has any liability for uh, losses uh, failure to perform for events beyond its reasonable control. Um, the important thing to remember there is that if your contract doesn't have one of those, then there is not one implied. You often see them in contracts and people think, oh, well, you know, surely that's, that's all implied, but it's not. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's something to bear in mind there, make sure it's one of those. We've talked a lot about traceability. Um, uh, this morning and so usually in food sector contracts there are clauses dealing with traceability, clauses dealing with duties for recalls and, and, and withdrawals and so all of those things may well be in your, in your, in your contract and so you need to comply with those. Uh, the, another important clause in these situations is liability provisions. Um, if you go into your contract, uh, usually there will be some limits of liability, both for you and, and your counterparty, but nothing in your contract will ever be able to limit your liability for causing death or injury um, by your negligence. Um, the important thing to remember is if you have a contract and there are no li limitation of liability clauses, then, you limit, then liability is unlimited. There is no implied limit to your your, um, to your liability. Other clauses to watch out for is occasionally you have audit clauses or you have rights to audit your supplier, you have obligations to allow audits by your customer. There may even be reporting requirements, particularly to customers. So if anything threatens the supply, your supply to them, um, then you may be under contractual obligation to tell them, which brings me round to, um, the importance, as we've heard from speakers already, um, of <coughs> the message. So in your contract, you are looking for clauses such as confidentiality clauses, clauses preventing parties making any announcements. All of those clauses should help you control the message. And, um, you know, if it gets really difficult, then uh, it can help with the enforcement of, of confidentiality duties. Um, 
that then usually in the confidentiality clauses though there are exemptions allowing you to discuss the matters with your professional advisors which would include just about everybody on this panel um, so you can still do that uh, without breaching confidential obligations to to third parties so if i may um before i ask the richard to take over i'll just say well what is what if there's not a contract what if you go to the drawer and you find out actually you can't find a contract with that supplier or that customer or um or your your it system's down this has happened to some clients of mine recently it systems are broken or um uh, subject to a cyber attack and so of course they can't find the contracts it's because the contracts are stored electronically um but if there is no contract, uh, written contract with your customer or your supplier, then there are implied terms. You've almost certainly got a contract with your customer, it's just it's not written down. Implied terms would include that goods are reasonably fit for purpose or a satisfactory quality. And this comes back to Jess's point about food should be fit for human consumption. Um, and even if you don't have a confidentiality clause, then your communication, you could label your communication as confidential. You could do what you do, uh, take other practical measures to try and create a implied duty of confidence with third parties that you're, that you're communicating with. Um, so that, that is that. Um, Richard, how would you sort of look at it from a, a litigator's point of view? Yeah, I mean, obviously we've heard Various themes come through it, one of which is obviously you know, planning, knowing your position, etc. But the thing I was, it's always difficult in a crisis, it's all a bit stressful and everything going off. It's trying to find time. Time is a very precious commodity at this point, and it's always easy to almost jump in the river to try and save your dog. Um, if you can't swim, you've not got a lifesaver on, it's probably not going to help anybody. So, so just take a bit of time back and so as a, as a dispute lawyer, uh, one of the key bits would say is obviously the first thing that I always say to clients is think very carefully about uh, the concept of privilege. It's very boring, but lawyers can add to a process this idea that what you say to us and then what we cause you perhaps to say to third parties, uh, nobody else can see. And that could be very important because in any crisis, you're going to hope there's a life after it. And that may be, and Eric alluded it before, you know, you may have some financial issues that you might want to be looking around at either getting from somebody or somebody getting from you. Um, so you're looking at the future. So don't create any adverse documents. Don't send an awkward email internally saying, oh my God, what a cock up we've made this week. Um, because potentially that is something that somebody is going to see, be it a regulator or in the course of any later litigation. So be very careful about that. And again, that loops back to your plan. You need to make sure you have a plan in place so that you immediately roll out and marshal that so everybody knows who's in charge of all that sort of side of it. Um, you also need to very carefully consider that in any of this process, you might have to mitigate your losses or damages. So when all this is going on, you need to try and think, how can I minimize the issues or the commercial problems that I'm going to have so that when I do come to make a claim, nobody can say to me that, well, you, you didn't think very carefully here. So half of these issues you're trying to claim off me are your own uh, doing. And that's quite important. And that also fits in with you need to work with all the key players around you. And some of those will be the people up and down on your chain. So even if you think it's somebody else's fault, you will still need to communicate with them. You need some thought how you do that in a manner that doesn't often admit liability, but you will still may need to work with those people because you know, on a regulatory perspective, you may need data and information from them. So if you sort of look around what what I, what I would say, it follows on from everybody, really. The key is, you know, get your plan in place so you know what you're going to do. You know where your contracts are. You know who the key players are. You know who you're going to have to talk to. You know, you don't want to be rummaging around in that drawer to find the contract. You don't have to be able to rummage, think, 
who was that insurance fellow that I saw at that conference and my broker said it's quite useful. Make sure you know about it. And I think Eric did say, I think he's dead right, you know, create people who have some control for it. So when you're going to, Sam will come on to talk to us about PR, etc. But, you know, do get the right people doing the right jobs. And just because you have the biggest title doesn't mean you are the right person to do some of these jobs because you might not be good at, you know, being a public face. So, oh yeah, that's, that's probably my thing from the other end of it, but yes. Great. Thank, thanks, Richard. And, and you, you mentioned um, uh, Sam, so we'll, 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 we'll bring in Sam here and Richard, you know, feel free to, to chip in because this is kind of relevant to, to some of the things you advise on as well. But I'm, I'm interested in this concept of, you know, social media and, and this sort of 24 hour news environment that we, we live in. Um, Sam, would you say that businesses are, are now more at risk than ever in terms of reputational damage or you know, does it work the other way as well? So does it provide a forum for an immediate response, for example? I suppose the temptation is there to to to, to sort of try and jump on it by 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 taking on the, the, the people in social media. Um you know, what, what's your view on that? And 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 sort of more generally, you know, what should a, a crisis communications plan include? Yeah. Um thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think if I just take your last question first, and it is really about how you prepare um, the plan and when. I can say glibly yesterday, and there always is a yesterday, but time is of the essence. And that plan really, depending on the structure of the organization, whether you have a board or whether it's part of your corporate governance, and within that risk management framework, it is a, a, a really high level plan that needs to have that buy-in from the very, very top. Um, so the best time to do one is when you're not dealing um, with a crisis. It is about having the process and the teams in place. And one of, I guess, the questions is, are you handling this in-house? If you're a big organization, you may well have that capability. If you don't, does it look like you bring in a resource if you have a crisis? And again, um, a point that Richard just made, it's understanding who those people are that you are going to bring in and making sure that they're across your business and when they may have to slot in. Um, brainstorm every eventuality, um, identify um, and proactively manage beforehand. So the key people you you need do try and think of everything and I know I know Eric said you can go into too much detail but you do need to really think the unthinkable and get the organization ready for when it happens you mentioned about social media I think a key component these days is social listening so that is when you're able to identify and assess um, the online conversations and those can be around the company it can be about certain products the brand or even individuals um, remember they they can present risks to you as well so you can use um, tools like Brandwatch or HubSpot but that's a really really important um, tool to be using understanding what is being said it's where you can find out potentially earlier on whether there is a potential issue with a particular brand or product um, Social media can be a plus and a minus. Um, I think what's important is you understand the narrative, you're in control of that narrative. And yes, we have the press and you may take a view that you don't necessarily want to engage with them. Again, Eric made a, a, a good point about you don't have to. However, make sure that you're in control of that narrative um, and how you utilize it. With social media, I mean, there is there is a very good aspect around being inclusive. And I don't think any of us um, should be disregarding that point at the moment, whoever it is. And do remember that, you know, 20 percent of the UK have a disability of some form. So remember to be inclusive as to how you communicate, whether you need to be using um, things like infographics to demonstrate actually what's happened, whether it's a um, facts frequently asked questions. So there are tools that you can use through social media that can be inclusive and um, you know what you need 
to be saying at the time, do stick to your facts always. They are important. Um, but, you know, again, with social media, understand who your stakeholders are and they will be varied. They can be between, um, as we've mentioned before, political activist groups. Um, they can be your customers. And whether you're B2C, B2B, um, you know, you could be a supplier to Marks and Spencers. Understand, again, contractually what you can and can't say. There may be things that you're not allowed to. So understanding as part of that plan as well and the stakeholders what you can and can't be saying. But I think my my key thing is around that that messaging, that narrative being in control as well. I think I'd, I'd, I'd 100% echo that. It's gone through what everything everybody has said. It, it, it can end up a very dear process, this, um, mm -hmm. without stating the blind and the obvious. But there is a definite way to make it less fatal and less expensive, and that is proactivity and taking control, um, and you know using the media to sometimes your advantage, using it as a mechanism to you know deliver a message. And as exactly as you say, you know sometimes the press can be irritating uh, in. You know, their, their interference in a crisis where they're potentially trying to get out a picture that isn't actually accurate. But the way to deal with all of that is, again, giving yourself this time. If you're reacting to an approach from the press or being hassled by a supplier or anything else in this process, it's harder to deal with if, if, if in effect, the first time you've thought about it is when you're in the eye of it. You know, and if you've never met Sam before, you're in the middle of this crisis. Well, that's awkward. Or Eric, etc. You, you've got to try and buy yourself that time, and that is planning. And you know, it, it, I I would echo everything everybody said about that. It is the best way to make sure this goes as well as it can and doesn't end up as a real disaster. Um, Eric, do you, do you want to jump in now? I see you've got your you got a yeah yeah. One of the things that um, I want to raise is do not invalidate your insurance. Do not go out there waving the white flag of surrender before you've taken advice from your insurance from your advisors because you could effectively uh, in you know impact the insurer's ability to defend a claim or to subrogate a claim. So you know before you go out there waving the white flag, speak to your clients, <laughs> speak to your insurers. Speak to your PR company, make sure that you, as it goes back to what Richard was saying and what Sam was saying, what Sam was saying, that you control the message. I agree that you have to share some information to the press. And, you know, the reality is a pathogen has got into the supply chain, um, you know, and that, that ends up seriously injuring or killing someone or a number of people. And you've just sat on your hands and not said a word. That clearly isn't the right thing to do. But manage what you say to the press. The one thing we always recommend you say is, Initially, we are dealing with an incident. Once we have further information to share with you, we will share it. And then make sure that a couple of hours later, you go back, right, we've now ascertained what has happened. We are now be able to give you some additional information. The press want to know, but the press are interested in one thing, selling papers. And, you know, the reality with the press is, especially with certain titles, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Absolutely. I think can I can I just add, and it's about the the internal comms. So <coughs> your internal um, people are as important as the external. So make sure that they are, as you mentioned before, Eric, um, what they can and can't do, and that comes back to policies, procedures. That's part of your risk management framework. So make sure that you've got that is in place. That the company has that. Um, but you know, people they can talk but it's making sure that there is there is a consequence if they speak and it's not about whistleblowing but there is there is a consequence and people need to very very clearly understand that just one of the thing is we talk about food but remember we've now got a lot of charities who are involved in food so whether it's the food bank or fair share they're really up against it with how they manage that food how they fridge it and also around those sell-by dates, which very often they're right on the cusp of. So, you know, I think that's going to be quite an emerging area that crisis management is going to be more key for um, part of the charity sector as well. And Sam, I'm quite interested in this, in this concept of, you know, trying to test your plan um, uh, right across the 
piece we've already talked about you know keeping it up to date and, and we'll perhaps come on to that again in a minute but but how would you go about testing a communications plan that strikes me as something quite difficult to do i mean you because by very its very nature your comms is externally facing so how, what would your suggestion be there um it actually goes back to what eric said before it's that scenario planning so um, we can call it a workshop, but I think, yes, if you call people to a room, you say, OK, here is our oh shit now. They don't need to know actually whether it's live or not. Um, but that is the best way to have that team operating and understanding um, how the plan is going to work, making sure have you got the right people in the right roles? Are you fully across um, all of your stakeholders, your narrative? Um, and then what's uh, the other point was that enables new people on the team as part of induction, et cetera. They know their place, their role. And the other thing is that enables you to learn. Um, you can incorporate into future learning. It may change behaviors as to how you take action. And remember, as well as all parts of this plan, the FSA, for example, do not disregard in all of your crisis comms, the SFA are, again, a very key stakeholder in this and how you will manage them, not disregarding how the lawyers will be involved as well. Um, but yeah, think the unthinkable, do those workshops, um, do them in real time, learn, um, may change behaviours, um, but it's about taking action and what you learn from it. Yes, um, I know I you've had your in, hand up. Yeah, yeah, I would add in there are um, specific notification obligations yeah. uh, depending on what the crisis is. If there is a breach of food safety requirements, it would depend on whether or not there's the potential for it to be injurious to health. There's an immediate notification obligation to enforcement agencies. Now, immediate uh, is open to some sort of investigation. You're going to have to know what batches are affected, where they've gone, um, in order to provide that notification. In relation to where there is a unfitness aspect, a quality aspect, there is equally a notification obligation for a withdrawal, but that immediate element um, has, has, has dropped away. Um, in relation to communications with enforcement agencies, whilst there is the requirement, obviously, to follow um, legislative requirements, I would just caution, um, as has been mentioned, there needs to be one point of contact. I would always advise legal advice prior to any contact with an enforcement agency. They're an enforcement agency. Uh, you know, you will have to do what is required, but... Uh, a great care needs to be taken and uh, also managing of that um, communication. Good, excellent. And, and Jess, you know, you, how how often do you think you should review a, 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 a plan? I know it's, it's very easy to draw one up. We've talked about situations where people come and go, but, but in your experience, how often do you think you should review a, a plan? Well, it does depend. Uh, it depends. It depends on the food product. It depends on the hazards. The higher the risk, the higher the hazards, the more often uh, the gold plate requirement would normally be once a year, uh, which might sound excessive. But actually, there's an awful lot of development, uh, contacts change, etc. Uh, but as well as reviewing that once a year, there should be uh, just in the same way as you do hack up of your um, processing systems that's hazard analysis critical control points you look at where the risk is within your supply chain where the pinch points are where there is a risk of quality um, being diminished uh, food fraud even where there is emerging information and test results of potential contaminations where you know that your markets are being particularly squeezed you should have an ongoing horizon scanning and review uh, to have that knowledge within your supply systems to know when to start testing for particular elements where you are most at risk um, so one it's an ongoing basis to be aware uh, and two it's uh, that the standard would be once 
a year to have a check. Don't leave it on the sort of dusty shelf. It doesn't do any good there. You need to actually sort of have it as an active document. Um, and it can be actually really useful as a way of um, checking over how the business is operating, how people are working together. And the only other thing that I would add in relation to this ongoing review is if you have been in a situation where you've had a practice or you've actually had a um, an incident or a crisis that has been managed, whether that's blown up or been contained, it's really important to also do the sort of aftermath review. How did you all work together? What could you do better next time? Uh, you know, where could you tighten this up? And um, again, before Richard comes in, if you actually have those recommendations, make sure you then implement them. Don't write them down and then don't implement them because that's something that you're falling uh, under your own standards there. So um, yeah, keep it an active, ongoing document. Just one other point, yeah. please, please, pretty please, with loads of cherries and whipped cream and sprinkles on the top, do not get into a blame culture. At the precise moment when things have gone wrong is not the time to start saying, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. It's their fault. That is something for after the event. That's the post-crisis, the post-business con continuity investigation. Because the moment you start throwing blame around, people will become defensive, potentially aggressive, or critical people may actually just walk away and say, look, I'm sorry, I'm not taking the blame for this. I'm not having this. I'm off. So please, please, please make sure that you have a clear strategy for post-incident investigation to identify what has actually gone wrong because the initial reaction may, you know, the initial incident may mask something further up the supply chain or further within the facility. It is a, it is a good point that a number of times I see bad things occur out the eye of the storm. You, you will sack a key member and it's great. That's, that's not help your team because you have to pull together. And these all, they all sometimes sound, you see these things they all sound a bit trite down there, everybody talks about team and, control and preparation but the funny thing is you know we all probably sat here have dealt with you know last year I had two or three pretty heavy crises across my desk and you know the stuff we're saying is born out of experience and it really does go badly when you fall out badly family companies do this particularly well uh, you fall out badly and start blaming and, and when we're talking about the first 24 48 hours of a crisis are critical you know, having fallouts and blame loses some of those hours. It puts so much more pressure on the situation, uh, which you just don't need to do at that point. There's plenty of time after things have calmed down to look at exploring how you can try and manage it better or not have it happen again. But, you know, falling out is probably not a good one. And the issue is it's about business response, business recovery. Mm. That's what you're focusing on at that time, protecting your reputation, making sure that if anything has got into the supply chain that is potentially you know, dangerous or deadly, that you deal with the matter in hand. Everything else can wait. Yeah. And also falling out with each other can create pieces of paper, messages, documents that you really don't want anybody else to see either. Because <laughs> that goes back to exactly what I said, don't create, which is, you know, that document says, oh my God, you idiot, you, you didn't do this. You know, that's manner in heaven to a regulator or a, an opponent in litigation should that arise yeah it goes it goes back to that famous oozel and bird analogy and running around in ever decreasing circles until you disappear up your own you know what you know <laughs> that's what you must avoid at a time like this open communication honest communication and somebody needs to be in the room to own it so if it does start to get a bit adversarial that individual can say stop this isn't the time or the place yeah. let's just focus on matter in hand it goes back to what Sam also said, there needs to be someone in control. Yeah. yeah. That's all really, really interesting points. I mean, it's, it's one of those uh, subjects where you, you could, you, you know, only really scratch the surface in an hour, really. But but some really interesting points. Uh, it does give rise to a, to a myriad of, of issues. Um, just to say to our audience, you know, if you're interested uh, in this subjects in particular and 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 you know perhaps a, a deep dive on on certain of the aspects of of crisis management in the sector then then do leave us some feedback in the in the um in the in the feedback form which will come out to you after this webinar we're always keen to to listen to your suggestions uh for for future events and 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 you know whether it be in person 
or, or virtually uh, uh, very, very interested in, 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 in your opinion as to whether you would like some follow up sessions. But but for now, um, thank you to all our, our panelists. It's been uh, the, the hour has, has gone by really quickly, which is always a good sign. Uh, thank you very much uh, to you for for attending. And um, we look forward to uh, welcoming you to, to future uh, webinars uh, hosted by Mills and Reeve. Thank you again to all of you. Thank you. Have a good the rest of the day. Thank you.